Die Titelstory im neuen Sternmagazin heißt Der große Bruder ist zurück. Ein Glück, dass es Joe Biden gibt. Im Konflikt mit Russland und China können wir uns wieder auf die USA verlassen. Was kommt Ihnen da als erstes in den Sinn, wenn Sie so eine Aussage eines führenden deutschen Magazins hören? The cover story in the new Stern Magazine is entitled Big Brother is back. It's good to have Joe Biden. In the conflict with Russia and China, we can rely on the USA again. What is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear such a statement from a leading German magazine? To be honest, the first thing that comes to my mind is the look on Olaf Scholz's face when he was in the White House as Joe Biden announced that he was going to destroy uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Um, I, I mean, that it's a priceless look. It's uh, it's the look of somebody who is uh, has been, you know, emasculated, uh, somebody who's no longer a man, somebody who's no longer a person, somebody who's no longer an adult. Uh, so the, in many ways, the Stern magazine cover is perfect uh, because it shows you know, Joe Biden leading a child um, and Olaf Scholz is a child. Um, so, yeah, it, you know, but then you, 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 conflict with China, what conflict with China? Um, is, is Germany trying to predict a war between the United States and China? Does Germany not understand that um, they're already in deep trouble because of the proxy conflict that we've got them involved with in Ukraine? And um, a conflict with China would be the uh, stake through the heart of the German vampire. Um, you're going to die. Uh, I don't know what's going on in Germany, what, what passes for um, you know, responsible citizenship nowadays. The fact that Germany continues to refuse to investigate the Nord Stream 2 uh, Nord Stream uh, attacks um, and, and, and now wants to hold the hands of the nation that carried out an economic Pearl Harbor against them. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in favor of the free press. I would never encourage, uh, you know, censorship or something like that. But I also believe that uh, citizens have a right to um, you know, opt who they want to read and who they don't want to read. And if Stern went out of business because of this, I wouldn't be unhappy. If people canceled their subscriptions, if people just said, nah, we don't want to participate in this, uh, that would be okay in my book too. Because uh, it, otherwise what the German people are saying is, yeah, this reflects who we are. This is this is us. We accept this. We accept being the child holding the hands of a doddering old senile American president who ordered a, uh, an attack against uh, German critical infrastructure, uh, causing critical harm to the German economy, violating German sovereignty. That's okay. I guess that's what Germany wants. Continue to be children. You're, you're pretty good at it. Was sagt das über das Selbstverständnis der deutschen Rolle in Europa aus? What does that say about how Germany sees its role in Europe? You know, Germany should see itself as the, as the natural leader of of Europe. Uh, Germany could be, especially a unified Germany, has all the potential of being a leader. Um, you know, it's, it's centrally located. Uh, it has a, an educated, industrious population. It has, um, you know, sufficient resources. Um, and it, it has uh, the, the intellectual acumen and the uh, work ethic that uh, when you combine these two, um, you know, it makes for a very productive nation. And uh, Germany should be a European leader. Um, and in many ways, within the Eurozone, Germany was a leader, um, you know, taking charge of uh, Euro policy uh, and, and things of that nature. But what, what Germany has done in the vis-a-vis um, -vis its relationship with the United States is um, – Again, I mean, it's it's harsh, but they've allowed themselves to be emasculated. And I don't mean to be insulting to the German women. I, I, I just can't come up with the appropriate term that is gender neutral. Um, the, 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 the fact is, though, you know, Germany should be a proud nation. And when I say proud, I don't mean Third Reich proud. Never again. Never again. Proud of who they are and what they've become. They, they have this tremendous potential. They're good people. Uh, they have you know, uh, a, a level of culture that, um, you know, is, is, is something to be proud of. Um, again, I'm not talking about third right culture. I'm talking about, you know, they're the arts, they're, they're musicians, they're painters, they're architects, they're philosophers. Um, 
And, and this is, they should be proud of this. Then they should be willing to put that on the table against anybody, especially a country that's only a couple hundred years old, whose greatest cultural contribution to the world appears to be McDonald's. So, um, and yet they're willing to subordinate this history that they have uh, to this, this, to what? I mean, you know, look, if I were a German, I would respect uh, what America used to be. After all, we did come across the Atlantic twice and kick your butts um, for good cause. Um, but, you know, <laughs> it's not our job to police the world uh, and it's not our job to tell you what to do. And uh, if, if Germany is behaving in a manner which reflects the realities of its history, remember, it shouldn't be about the United States or anybody else telling Germany what they should or shouldn't do. It should be about the Germans themselves. You don't need me or anybody else to say, you know, you guys can never again go down the path of combining nationalism, industrialism and militarism, create a new Third Reich. You don't need me to tell you that you're smart enough to look in the mirror and say never again. Never again shouldn't be outsiders shouting at the Germans. It should be Germans waking up every morning, looking in the mirror and saying never again. But that doesn't mean that you can't be somebody. In fact, you can be much more than that. Um, that's the thing about German potential, the potential of Germany to be this wonderful nation of culture, of enterprise, of industry, of, you know, imagination um, is there. Why do you have to hold America's hand? Why? I mean, if you want to shake our hand, I'll shake your hand. I, I, I'd love to be friends with the Germans. Um I'd love to visit Germany and tour Germany. I live there. It's a wonderful country with wonderful people. Um, but the second you allow yourself to be cast in the position of a child holding the hand of America and needing America's guidance, you know, if you follow America, you will get a conflict with China. You followed America and you got a conflict with Russia. Had you been Germany, you would have been able to stand up to the United States and say no when it came to the issue of Russian gas, because Germany knew that Russian gas was not a threat to Germany. Germany knew that Russian gas was the key to German economic success. There's a movie, uh, Love Actually. I know it's a fantasy movie. We don't, you know, people like, you know, we shouldn't be projecting Hollywood stereotypes into reality, but there was a scene there that was pretty cool. Uh, it's when Hugh Grant's uh, prime minister character uh, is standing up to uh, Billy Bob Thornton's American president character. And um, it showed the United States coming in and trying to do what the Stern magazine is, hold the hand of a lesser, guide them through this problem as the adult in the room. And yet what the Hugh Grant character did is stand up and say, no, that's not how this works. Olaf Scholz had an opportunity to be a historic figure. A historic figure, because when Joe Biden in the White House said, we're going to blow up Nord Stream, Ola Schultz should have said, time out. Mr. President, I want to correct you right here. Now, you will never blow up Nord Stream. It's my pipeline. It's Germans, Germany's pipeline. It belongs to us. It does what we want it to do. And we alone make that decision. And if you attack it, you're attacking us. At the war. In fact, is right now, I feel a little bit of hostility, Mr. President. So I'm leaving the White House right now. And with me comes the German ambassador. And I'm taking your ambassador out. And you can reflect on this while I kick every one of your military guys out of the country, too, because that's not what friends do. But America's not your friend. America doesn't want good things to happen to you. And this is the mistake. You see, when you view America as an adult and Germany as a child, the assumption in that isn't just a superior to a lesser, but a nurturing parent to uh, a, a, a child that's being you know, educated and, and brought into adulthood. Hey, guys, Jeremy, you're adults. You don't need that relationship. And Joe Biden's not the nurturing parent. He's the evil guy that's leading you off to dark deeds. America doesn't like you. America doesn't support you. America attacked you. Let me say that one more time. America attacked you. Why would you hold the hand of the man 
who ordered an economic Pearl Harbor against Germany. So, yeah, I mean, that hopefully that cover provokes some people into, um, you know, realizing the absolute depravity of this relationship between the United States and Germany. Das britische Magazin The Spectator schreibt hingegen in seiner Titelstory, dass sich die Weltordnung nach den Vorstellungen des russischen Präsidenten Wladimir Putin ändert, weil die meisten Länder des sogenannten globalen Südens nicht dem westlichen Narrativ im Ukraine-Krieg folgen. Teilen Sie diese Einschätzung des britischen Magazins? On the other hand, the British magazine, The Spectator, writes in its cover story that the world order is changing according to the ideas of Russian President Vladimir Putin because most countries of the so-called Global South are not following the Western narrative in the Ukraine war. Do you share this assessment of the British magazine? I've always shared this assessment. Um fact is, before the war started, when the uh, United States and Europe uh, were speaking about um, uh, imposing stringent sanctions against uh, Russia, I predicted that these sanctions would backfire because the world is tired of sanctions. The world doesn't agree with an American-centric uh, uh, world vision. Um, you know, we, we've spoken for some time now, we being analysts in the West, about the uh, you know, uh, the, the, the impending collapse of the West, uh, that the United States had run its course and that uh, we were going to see the end of American uh, singularity and the beginning of a multipolar world. And it was interesting because I'd present this at conferences and meetings uh, with very senior people in attendance, and they would all nod their heads and clap politely and very nice presentation, Mr. Ritter. We applaud your intellectual acumen. But see, I was speaking theoretically at that time. I was speaking about something that would happen down the road. It's happening right now. Around us, we see the end of the American singularity. We see the rejection of America's bullying uh, relationship with the world. We see the developing South, and it's an area they call it the development South. I'd, I'd call it the developed South. Um, unlike that last magazine where you had the American adult holding hands, Develops out are grown people telling Uncle Joe, get away. We're on our own. They've grown up. They're behaving like adults. Hey, hint, Germany, that could be you too. But you opted out. Uh, but they they basically said, we're, we're, we're grown ups. We don't want to live in uh, Uncle Joe's basement anymore. Uh, we want to go out and be on our own and, and develop. It's happening as we speak. And for, um, you know, this, this, the, 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 the British to finally wake up, it's, it's a reality check. I mean, you, You can only live behind um, a propaganda-driven perception for so long. I mean, you know, you can sit in your house and you can look in the mirror and you can tell, tell yourself all these things. But eventually you got to leave the house and there's a reality out there. And I think what's happening now is Europe um, is starting to wake up to the fact that uh, they bet on the wrong horse. You know, someone sold them a bill of goods. They said, pick Uncle Joe uh, to win in race number three. And uh, Uncle Joe's lame and he's coming in last. Um, meanwhile, the horse that they said don't bet on, you know, prickly Putin is coming in first by four lengths, not even close. That's that's what's happening right now. And um, I don't mean to be too glib about it because it's it, it, it creates friction. It creates I mean, what's happening in Ukraine is just an absolute tragedy, just a humanitarian tragedy, an avoidable conflict. But it was solely driven by the West, solely driven by the West. Um, and I think the rest of the world's waking up saying, we don't want this to happen. Look what's happening in Taiwan. I mean, the United States is doing its best to provoke a war in Taiwan. But the Taiwanese people are starting to look around saying, we don't want the Ukrainian model. <laughs> you know, because I think the world's waking up that when the United States embraces you as a friend, you end up dying. And so I think the Taiwanese are starting to say, uh, Uncle Joe, don't hug us, man. We don't want to die. And I think the rest of the world is pretty much saying the same thing. That when we go to dinner with Uncle Joe, uh, our food gets poisoned. Um, maybe we want to go to general uh, dinner with uh, you know, Mr. Putin over here. Uh, if the food tends to be pretty good. We, we feel nice and rested afterwards. That's the meal we want. No one wants to sit down at the table with America anymore because we were poisoned. 
Russland hat vergangene Woche den Atomwaffenkontrollvertrag New Start ausgesetzt. Was bedeutet das genau und was sind die Konsequenzen daraus? Last week Russia suspended the New Start Nuclear Arms Control Treaty. What does that mean exactly and what are the consequences? Well, the Russians did it for cause. Um, you know, it, it, things don't happen in a vacuum. And I think people need to understand and, and Germany needs to reflect on this as well. Uh, because Germany is deeply involved. Um, you know, there was a time, and many Germans of my age might remember this, when uh, Germans actually went to the street uh, in protest against uh, the uh, decision to deploy intermediate nuclear missiles on German soil. The Germans understood what the consequences of that would be, which means the destruction of Germany if there's a war. Um, and uh, And yet it happened. But then Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev signed the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, and those weapons went away. And there was a period of time where Germany, uh, Germans, both East, West, and later on unified, uh, could sleep well at night, uh, fear from the uh, free from the fear of immediate nuclear annihilation. Well, those days are gone, Germany. Uh, it's time to fear again. And again, don't blame Russia. Blame the United States. The United States withdrew from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 2002. The United States forward deployed ballistic missile defense systems on a newly acquired NATO territory in Poland and Romania, lied about these systems, saying, oh, they're just for the Iranians. Well, no, it doesn't make any sense. The Iranian missiles aren't going to be shot down by these. Then they said, and they're just for, uh, you know, they can only shoot down short range missiles. Don't worry about them. Two years later, we deploy a missile system that can shoot down intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, we lie all the time. Um, Germany, I just want to remind you, America lies every time they open their mouth. So just let's settle on that reality for a second. Um, we withdrew from the I, uh, INF Treaty. We withdrew from it. And now we've strong-armed Germany to join a NATO posture that speaks of the strategic defeat of Russia. Now, Germany, you might, I, I don't know how to say this in the German language, but let me tell you what strategic defeat of Russia means in the English language. And it means Russia is destroyed, that the current configuration of Russia is no more, that their government collapses, and that Russia is actually broken up into uh, smaller constituent parts. Or, that's one outcome, or Russia is reduced to radio, uh, you know, radiological, um, radioactive waste by nuclear weapons, um, which means Germany will also be a heap of radioactive ash. That's what it means. And you embrace this. Now, imagine if you're a Russian and you're hearing this and the Russians say, wait, you want our strategic defeat. At the same time, you want to have American inspectors come onto our soil to inspect newly commissioned weapon systems that were designed to defeat the missile defense systems that Americans built after they withdrew from the treaty that prevented these things. Why would we allow this to happen? You see, we would do that. If we had friendly relations, if we had normal relations, because it's based upon mutual respect and mutual trust. But we you don't respect us anymore. This is the Russian perspective and we don't trust you anymore. So you will never gain access to these sites as long as this goal of strategic defeat uh, is there. And that's the case. And this means that arms control is dead. Now, let me give another news flash to, uh, to the Germans out there. If the Americans don't restart, start. You're all going to die. We can smile about it, but I'm being dead serious because nuclear weapons are the one thing that can end life like that right now, and they exist. And they exist in an environment where the two nations that possess them are engaged in an existential struggle. Again, I don't know what that word means in German, but here it means that if you lose an existential struggle, you're done, you're defeated, you're dead. It's existential in nature. And so that's what's going on right now. And nuclear powers, another thing Germans should reflect on, don't lose existential struggles. That's the whole purpose of the nuclear arsenal. You see, it provides assurances that you will never be existentially defeated. And uh, so any effort to achieve the existential defeat of Russia is actually suicide. Because it means if you succeed, Russia is going to kill you all. And 
The only thing that prevents this is arms control. Arms control that not only limits, prevents an arms race, but actually starts the very difficult business of drawing down nuclear arsenals and creating a framework that discourages nuclear conflict. It creates trust. It creates you know, mutual uh, respect through reciprocity. Um, and that's gone. This treaty expires in 2026. Right now, both sides say that even though they've suspended it, they're going to continue to adhere to it. So we're going to live and continue to labor under the false assumption that everything's okay, because between now and 2026, both sides will hopefully comply. But if the treaty expires in 2026, and it's not late 2026, it's February 2026, um, there's no more arms control. And what happens? that point in time we become we begin to uh, become concerned of what we don't know you see we don't have inspectors on the ground anymore that means we're ignorant and from ignorance comes fear we become afraid of the russians and then we start to project and one of the things america is very good at is mirror imaging projecting a mirror image onto the russians so we'd say well what would we do in that situation and we know We're going to build up our nuclear weapons and we're going to try and leverage uh, it to our advantage so we can carry out a preventive, a preemptive nuclear strike so that we can win a nuclear war. And so we say, well, that's what the Russians are going to do. So we then begin to build up to respond to this threat. Next thing you know, we have an arms race and one accident, one mistake, one miscalculation, and we all die. And because we're humans, We have accidents, we have mistakes, we have miscalculations, which means it's not a possibility that we're all going to die. It is a probability that we're all going to die. 